The righteous are on trial. You had better believe it. The righteous are on trial. I want you to go to Psalms, the 11th chapter, if you will, please. Psalm 11th chapter. <clears throat> and I want to read just uh, two verses. Psalms 11, uh, verses uh, 4 and 5. Psalms 11. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth who? The righteous. But the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Let's pray. Father, your church, the body of Christ, is in great crisis. There is trouble, there is testing, there is trial as never before in history. Lord, you've taken every church age through great turmoil, testing, the waters and the fires of testing have been with us for many centuries. But, oh God, in the last days, you've made it clear that it's going to be intensified. And there are people here tonight, Christians, who don't understand what they're going through. Great testing, great trial, great temptations, great afflictions. Lord, give us an understanding tonight. Show us what it's all about so that we'll not be tossed by it, we'll not be overwhelmed by it, that we will be in the knowledge of the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, open it to us. Help us to understand. Lord, we need you. We need you tonight to make this understandable to us. Give us an understanding by the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name, anoint me. Amen. You know, we have nearly 800,000 people on our mailing list, and so we get thousands of letters every week. Let me read to you just a little sampling of what we're hearing from all of the United States. A dear sister wrote this week, two years ago, while tending my business, I fell and broke my leg. One month later, I was hit head-on by a motorist and left me in a wheelchair with another broken leg and a crushed knee, and I've not been able to collect any insurance from the person's insurance company, in other words, the one who hit her in a head-on collision. I had to give up my business as I could no longer run it. Six months later, I found I had ovarian cancer. I've been in chemotherapy for a year and two months, but the cancer still rages on. I look around at other Christians, and I find so many that are suffering untold illnesses, especially cancer and other hardships. I'm part of an intercessory prayer group. For the day, she asked, what's happening to the body of Christ? She belongs to an intercessory prayer group and prays for others, even though she's in such great need. And this was her question at the, at the end of her letter. Pastor Dave, what's happening to the body of Christ? We get letters from pastor's wives now from all over the world. Pastor's wives who, who beseech us to pray for their pastor husbands. Their husbands who are ministering the word and ready to give up the ministry, ready to quit all over the United States. It, the, the letters are pitiful. One lady wrote this week, she said, my husband is disillusioned, absolutely disillusioned. People in this area do not want to hear the straight gospel. And so many are going to these churches preaching false doctrines. My husband is totally disillusioned by all the foolishness in the church and can't find a congregation that will accept his preaching. He wonders now because he's on the shelf if... God is even hearing and answering his prayers anymore. He won't be consoled by me. He's beyond being consoled. In fact, he's been so discouraged in his last pulpit that he stood and started reading the sermons of dead men of God of past years, just reading his sermons, so dead and so empty and so dry. There's a letter from a farmer's wife. I think it was in Iowa. And she said, Pastor David, for nearly 25 years now, we have been serving God faithfully. We've raised our children for the Lord, one or two in the ministry, one, one in the ministry, one preparing for the ministry. We've been baptized with the Holy Ghost for years. But lately, my husband and I feel the Lord is not answering our prayers anymore. 
My husband feels like a total failure. He won't let me help him. He's so down. We are in a financial crisis. We may lose our farm. We've been farming for 25 years. Our, our farm business has been subject to stuff beyond our control, like the weather, good crops, yields, production. And all of these things are beyond our, our human effort. And God has to do it miraculously. But we feel now that God doesn't seem to be answering our prayers. We're falling behind. Without a miracle, we may have to sell our farm to our creditors. And folks, letters are pouring into our office now from all over the United States. These are godly people who are going through severe, overwhelming trials. They are being tested financially, physically, mentally, in every other way. Going through fires and sickness and financial difficulties, family troubles. And folks, I have been sending out newsletters now for 25 years or more, almost 27 years, and in 27 years, I can tell you, it has never been as intense as it is now. These letters are overwhelming. I have to stop reading after a while. My wife reads for hours and hours all day long, but I have to pull back. I can hardly handle it. The problems are absolutely mind-boggling. The intensity. Now, let me ask you, as you sit in this congregation tonight, are you not being tested more now than you've ever been tested in your life? Are you not seeing things that are so intense, so overwhelming, you wonder how, outside of God's miracle power, that you can ever get out of it? Troubles and tests. And by the way, folks, if you are not, as I say, it won't take long. It will come. You are going to go into the fire. You're going to go into the deep waters. You're going to go into stuff that's over your head that you don't understand. You're going to have troubles on all sides. You're going to be tested in your body, in your spirit, in your mind. You're going to be tested in your family. You're going to be tested on the job. You're going to be tested even in the house of God. You're going to be tested. Your marriage, if your marriage is going to be tested, your, your, your livelihood, everything is going to be tested. We are going into a time of great testing. Now we know from uh, Revelation 3.10 that the word predicts that in the last days there's going to be a time of great testing, a great, it's called an hour of tribulation to try all mankind. But God has promised to deliver us out of that great tribulation or that, that the, the last of that great time of affliction upon the earth. In fact, you read Revelation 3.10 and that's what the promise is. Clear as can be. I will keep you from that hour of temptation that will fall upon the whole earth. Now, some believe we'll go through a part of the tribulation. Some believe we'll go through it all. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a time uh, when the wrath of God is falling on the earth. We're going to be delivered from the wrath of God. But in the meantime, you and I, as Christians, as righteous men and women, we are going to be tested more and more as the day of the Lord approaches. The closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the closer we get to the end of time, the more intense the fires will be, the deeper the waters. Folks, don't let it scare you because God has a purpose in it all. God has a reason and we want you to understand that reason tonight. In Psalms 11.4, I've just read to you that God is right now in his holy temple. He is sitting on his throne and he, his eyelids are trying to, the sons of men, his eyelids are trying. Now, in the original Hebrew, it, it really means a sharp, piercing glance. He has a penetrating look into the depths of the heart, such as a ray that pierces an object, gets right into the depth of it. Nothing can hinder this x-ray that goes through right to the heart of things. And really, in the Hebrew, it means God is squinting his eyes for a more concentrated look into the heart. You know, when you look at something, uh, you're looking at, you squint your eye. It, this is what it means. God is squinting his eye and looking down deep into your heart. He's going to test you until everything that's unlike him is going to come to the surface and come out. He's going to put you in the fire so that all, the, all, of the, all of that is unlike him, all that is evil is going to come to the surface and he can scrape it off and... He wants nothing left in you in the last days but pure gold. He's going to put you in the fire, he said. He's going to put it. It's the Lord. It's not the devil. It's the Lord. 
He's the one who's going to do the trying. He's the one who's doing the testing. You don't understand right now that God, and, and this ought to comfort your heart, that God has his eye on you. His eye is not only on you. He's got a his, his best eye. He's squinting. He is looking deep into your heart like a man who's got one of those little jewel uh, magnifiers looking deep into your heart. Hallelujah. If you love the Lord, that ought to be a wonderful encouragement to you because the Lord knows where you're at. He knows what you're doing. He's not forgotten you. He knows every difficulty, every trouble that you're going through. For thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Jeremiah 32, 19. Another scripture. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord and he pondereth all his goings. In other words, God is looking right at your direction and he is... Considering every move you make, every thought that you think. Now, folks, God monitors it all. We sometimes sit around and we just talk flippantly. But you know, God is monitoring every thought, every word, and every deed. He's keeping a record. How many believe that? He is keeping a record. I think it pays us to watch our tongues. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And you know this when the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show him strong himself strong on behalf of those who love him. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. And I read to you here, look at, again in, in chapter 11, verse 5. The Lord trieth the righteous. The Lord trieth the righteous. But why? Why does the Lord try his own children? Folks, it all has to do with faith. Everything we're talking about now is a trial of your faith. Now, the key to understanding the great trials that you and I are facing, are going to face, you've got to go to 1 Peter to understand it. 1 Peter, the first chapter. Turn there with me, please. I'm going to ask the Holy Ghost to open your eyes and your understanding as to why you're going through what you're going through. Now, folks, beloved, would you look this way for just a minute? Before I go any further, I want to know in the balcony and here on the main floor and even behind me here in the choir and staff and everything else, how many of you, in all honesty, said, Brother Wilson, what you say is true. I have this past year, especially, I am facing the greatest troubles, trials, and testing in my whole Christian experience. Would you raise your hand, please? Uh huh. Oh, I just want to make sure I'm on the right track here before I go any further. All right. Amen. If you didn't have your hands up, uh, Yeah, by the tape. The Lord does not want any of us to be ignorant of what we're going through. Because he doesn't tease his children. He gets no pleasure out of hurting us. But he has a very clear good reason why he takes us through these things. The sufferings and the pain and the sorrow and the afflictions, God has a reason. And he showed this to me. And, it, and folks, it, it was so easy, your spirit, it will encourage your heart when you know that, first of all, that God is allowing it. God is taking you into the fire. And he's taking you into the deep waters because he has a divine purpose. as an eternal purpose in what he is doing. Many, many are going to hear this message on tape, and just like the, the farmers in Iowa and Montana and all the Midwest that are losing their farms, and people all over the United States who write to us and send prayer requests. Many, many write for our message, and they're going to hear this on tape. And I, my message to them is the same thing, that God wants them to understand why this is happening. It's not just a happenstance. It's not a fluke. God has a purpose. And if you can see that purpose, it'll hold you steady. Let's go to that purpose. First Peter, the first chapter, beginning to read 
verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through what? Through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, folks, look at me. It is absolutely vital that you understand what is being said here because it fully explains why God is allowing you to go through what you're experiencing right now. It is vital for you to get this. And here's what the scripture is saying in 1 Peter uh, 5, 6, 7, and 8. It's a full explanation. God is saying a time of shaking is coming. You know what the scripture says. God said, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. So the only thing left standing is that which cannot be shaken. What is it that cannot be shaken? He's looking for an unshakable faith. Faith. This whole thing has to do with faith. Everything you're going through, everything is a trial of your faith. Now get that and understand that. If you don't get that, you, you will never comprehend what you're going through. God says wickedness is going to bring on chaos. There will be calamity. Violence is going to rock and shake the nations. Evil men are going to wax worse and worse, become vicious. Morals are going to crumble and vanish. All of mankind is going to fear and tremble. Men's hearts are going to fail them for fear of seeing those things coming on the earth. You know all of these scriptural prophecies. It will seem as though no one has answers. Everything will be hopeless. This is a day and age when no one seems to have an answer for the world situation, the crises that come upon us hour by hour. And this is what the Lord is going, what is saying. He said, in this hour, just before I come in the last days, when everything is shaken, when men have no hope, when people are crumbling and being crushed by the pressures all around them, the stress and the anxiety and the depression, God says, I have a people that are in the fire right now being trained and I am going to reveal them in the last hour. And that's what I read to you who are being kept right now through the power of faith. God said, I'm testing their faith right now. I'm keeping them. I've got them in deep trouble. I've got them in deep waters now. I've got them in fires. I am bringing forth a people out of those fires and out of those waters to be manifested before the whole world as testimonies of the saving, keeping power in the most difficult times. Dark times are coming. Hopeless times are coming. Where are they going to turn to? Do you think they're going to turn to our leaders? Not when our presidential advisors are advising our presidents and our leaders out of the boudoirs of prostitutes. Do you think the world is going to trust their leadership anymore? Where are people going to turn to? Where are people going to get their hope? Not from television evangelists who've been uh, muckracking around for uh, money and, and proclaiming the gospel to be a uh, rich man's gospel. Where are they going to turn to? They'll not be turning to healing evangelists in their healing lines anymore. I'm not putting that down, but that's not where the answer is going to be. It's not going to be in big time evangelists or big time preachers. They are going to have to have people like themselves who've been through their kind of troubles and their kind of trials and being tested. And they come through it and they're like a rock of Gibraltar and they're standing unmoved and unshaken because their faith has been tested. That's what he's saying here through faith and to salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. God says, I'm going to reveal I'm going to manifest my children at the last hour. And oh, thank God, I believe that with everything in my being. I stand before you totally convinced that right here in New York City, the greatest testimony is going to be people out of this church and other churches that have been absolutely tested as nobody else has been tested. They've had it harder than anybody. They have gone through the fires and the deep waters and they have not given up their faith. Their faith is unshakable. And the Lord says, all right, you've been through it. I'm going to bring you out as a testimony. 
I'm going to reveal you to your neighbors. I'm going to reveal you on the job. I'm going to reveal you in New York City or wherever you are in the farms of Iowa. Everywhere God is going to have a people that come marching out like the Hebrew children out of the fiery furnace as a testimony to the king and all of the heat of that time. They said, your God is our God now. i got to quit pounding this. Pulpit is getting weak. To be revealed in the last time, kept by faith. Oh, hallelujah. Tried by fire, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for season, if need be, you're in heaviness. I, I used to wonder, how in the world do you rejoice when you're heavy? In heaviness. He said, though you're in heaviness for a season, you're going to rejoice. How can you rejoice? Well, the Lord began to show me. You can rejoice when you know that God's doing something in me. I'm in this for a purpose. God's working something in me. God's trying to make me a man of faith. He's trying to make me, you you're a woman of faith. He's trying to make you a testimony to the whole world. It's not going to be any more going around quoting a few scriptures and shooting your scriptures at somebody and giving a little testimony. That's not it. It's not going to be that. People are going to look at you and they see what you're going through and it doesn't shake you. You're still praising God. You're still speaking faith. You're not talking doubt and fear and unbelief. And they say, that's what I want. Whatever keeps you, I want it to keep me. Because everybody around is going to be caving in. Everybody's going to be crumbling. Everybody's going to be crushed. And there you stand. Much more precious than gold, though tried with fire, may be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The Lord said, at my coming, I have to have a people. I have to have a people be a praise and glory to my saving, keeping power. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, believe it or not, or accept it or not, <clears throat> you've been chosen to be tested. I'm going to tell you now, if you're going through it, if you're being tested by fire, that's a calling. God's called you. God wouldn't do this. He wouldn't allow it unless he looked down and saw something in you. He's not going to waste time with anybody. God doesn't waste time. God doesn't waste effort. And he saw something in you. And he said, I know that this sister is going to come forth as gold, and I'm going to put her in the fire and I'm going to let her feel the pain. of Folks, fire hurts. Fire is painful. Try sticking your finger in it and say, it's painful. It hurts. The suffering, there is suffering, physical suffering, pain. Some of you, dear sisters, are going through great pain. Like this sister who wrote that, that has, she's taking chemotherapy and she's still having cancer, but she's still going to prayer meetings, still interceding. Her faith is going to come out of its strong. What a testimony she is. She said, the question was asked, what's happening to the body of Christ? I'll tell you what's happening to the body of Christ. The Lord has looked out on the body of Christ and he's seen some, he's seen a host of people say, you, sir, you, I'm going to put you in the fire because I know that you're going to come out as my testimony and toward the coming of the Lord in the last days, you're going to praise and honor and glory to my name. I'm going to take you in it. I'm going to bring you out of it. You're going to shine forth. You're going to be a man of faith. You're going to be a woman of faith. I can trust you. I've called you. You have been called to suffering. Now, folks, that is absolutely uh, contrary to the prosperity gospel that says you don't have to suffer. Well, that means you don't have a testimony either. You're not going to be used in the last day other than to accumulate your goods which are all going to burn, anyhow. All going to burn. That Mercedes is going to burn. It's going to burn. That big house is going to burn. But my faith is going to be gold. No fire can touch it. Nothing can touch my faith. We marvel at the unbelief of the Israelites in the wilderness, don't we? We see them doubting God ten different 
on ten different testings. They doubt God. And folks, if you read Psalm 78, don't turn there now, but Psalm 78 is one of the saddest chapters in all the Bible. It is frightening to see God trying to, what God had tended for these people very clearly. In fact, it, it, the chapter begins, don't turn, but the chapter begins with this. He established the testimony in Jacob that the generation to come might know what he's saying. I, here, here was God's plan. God says, I'm going to take a people who are really the smallest people, the smallest nation on earth, and I'm going to take them to myself. I'm going to take them into a wilderness where they're totally dependent on me. There's no shopping malls. There's no water. There's no food. There's nothing but sand. I'm going to put them out in no place, nowhere where they have to be totally dependent on me. And I'm going to teach them to trust me so that I will have a testimony for every succeeding generation. I can point back and say, no matter what you go through, here's a people who prove me. God said, I'm going to prove them. And that's what he did. He took them to the Red Sea to prove them, and they failed in their faith there. They, they said, you brought us out here to kill us, oh God, accusing Moses of, of, of bringing them out to slaughter them. They go to the waters of Mara. And again, they murmur and they complain. God was testing these. I'm going to let them suffer a little pain. I'm going to let them suffer hunger. Let them suffer thirst. And there was some suffering involved to it. But God was trying to build faith. He was trying to build a people that would come through all of these troubles and all these trials. And there would be not only this written word here, but there would be living testimonies, living epistles of his power to save and keep in any generation so that we wouldn't be reading Psalm 78. They failed, they failed, they failed, they failed. In fact, let me read it. says, their spirit was not steadfast with God. They forgot his miracles. They tempted God. They murmured. They complained. They believed not in God. They trusted not in his salvation. They believed not his wondrous works. They uh, grieved him in the wilderness. They limited the Holy One of Israel. They provoked him. They kept not his testimony. They kept not his testimony. They refused to be that testimony for all other generations. And by the way, all of their children go into the promised land with no testimony behind them. All they had was the testimony of unbelief and what their father's lives, their mother's and father's lives really said by the way they, they lived was that God can't keep you, God can't uh, see you through, that God fails his children. That was the testimony they got from their parents. And God had intended that they be a testimony to their children, their grandchildren, and their great-great-grandchildren, and a testimony to us today. In this year, 1996, and talking from Psalm 78 about their failures, we should be reading about, they came to the waters and they trusted God and the waters opened. They went to the bitter waters of Merrill and they said, our God who opened the Red Sea can heal these waters. And we would have been reading one story after another and our faith would have been encouraged. What will happen with us when Jesus says this, will I find faith when I return on the earth? So God once again is taking a people through the deep waters and into the wilderness where the only thing that's going to see us through is total dependence on him where we don't try to figure it out ourselves. It's total dependence on him. I better move on. I thought I only had a 30-minute message here. I think I've got a little longer one here. I'll tell you what I want to do. Let me ask you. Do, do you, you take this to your own heart. Do you want to be that testimony in these last days? Do, do you want to be a testimony... Would you like to be one who comes out of the fires and you didn't cave in, you didn't murmur, you didn't complain, you didn't gripe, but you were able to say, live or die, I'm the Lord's. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I'm not going to give up. How about you fellas, you former drug addicts, alcoholics here in the front from Timothy House. You want to be a testimony to your family and to all those junkies that you used to run with? That God's able to keep you no matter what, no matter how discouraged you get, no matter how many lies the devil comes throwing at you, you're going to stand? How many? Raise your hand. Wave it at me right now. Say, brother, that's what I want. Same over here, Sarah House. How about it? Amen. 
Well, let me give you something to encourage your faith. Where I saw this and it just really blessed me. Hallelujah. Go to Psalms 89. Psalms 89. I'm going to read two scriptures. And boy, when I saw this, it just blew me away spiritually to the, to the joy of the Lord. Now, you won't understand it when you first read it, perhaps, but when we explain it to you, you understand how this is one of the greatest encouragements to faith in all the Bible. What a great encouragement to your faith, so that it'll hold you during your storm and during your trial. Verse 9 and 10. Thou rulest the raging of the sea, when the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces. Now, folks, that is one of the most powerful Incentives of faith in all the word of God. It's one of the most powerful. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. All right, look at me, please. The Bible makes it very, very clear. God rules the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, arise, thou stillest them. According to the psalmist, he commands, that's God commands, and he raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth the waves thereof. Now look at me, please. When you read of these waves, you're talking about a storm. God raises a storm. Are you in a storm? God raises the storm, the Bible says. And he speaks the word, and he stills the waters. He lifts them, and he lowers them. God sits king of the flood. He sits the king of the flood, even when the devil brings his floods, the flood of iniquity, the flood of, the flood of passion, or of lust, or desires of the flesh. When these things come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raises up a standard, the Bible said. But he rules the floods, he rules the seas. The Bible talks about those that are at the wit's end because, uh, let, let me read it to you. They are at the wit's end. Then they cry to the Lord in their trouble, and he brings them out of their distresses. He's talking about sailors at sea, and the, the waves and the storm that suddenly is upon them. The scripture says, thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. Uh, a few weeks ago, or a week ago when Hurricane Edward came and hit the east coast, we were looking out of our window. We faced the uh, East River where the boats are in there. And this, this huge cruise ship, uh, I, I think it, there are over 2,000 people that can go on that particular cruise boat. A huge, it's like a city. And it was pulling out. And uh, on radio, they were warning that, that the hurricane was coming. And this big ship's heading for the Caribbean, right into the hurricane. And they're pulling out last week. And I turned to Gwen and I said, Honey, that, this is stupid. This is crazy. That's going to be a trip through hell. They're going to be right in the middle of the hurricane. And sure enough, the next day, 24 hours later, the headlines on the daily news, cruise to hell. That There were 70 foot waves hitting that boat. The boat was listing. People were sleeping in the halls and screaming. In fact, some of the rich people were offering their fortune to have somebody come in helicopter and get them off. They were offering all their, their everything they had. If you'll just get us to land. And they came back and they said it was a living hell. Who would go into a hurricane? You and me. Yes. And the boat begins to list and we're shaking. Oh God, that's enough. Anything, get me out. Come on. The worst thing is that none of the captains or anybody running the boat knew how to speak English, so they couldn't say anything to the people <laughs> to comfort them. You wouldn't get me on one of those cruise ships where I don't like to fly, but I don't like to cruise worse than I don't like to fly. <laughs> But see, your, your faith is put into that hurricane, into that storm. And God's seeking a people who are going to rejoice and not complain and rest in his love. 
and just rest. God, you're king of this flood. You brought me in here. I'm not going down. It may look like I'm going down. I'm going to hold steady. I am going to believe you to bring me out of this hurricane. Folks, I'm not even talking about a storm. This is a big storm. And some of you are in that right now. Oh, hallelujah. Do you understand that he rules the waters? The tossing, the turn. He's ruler of it all. Shouldn't that bring faith? Shouldn't that encourage our faith? Whatever I'm going through, God knows all about it. He rules. He rules the tossings and turnings in my life. He rules it all. And he knows when to steal it. He knows when to calm the storm. He speaks to the storm and he brings the calm. But he won't do it until he accomplishes his purpose. Until he sees that you're willing to trust him. You just lay back in his arms and say, live or die, I am his. And when you come to that place, then he's going to calm the storm. When he's accomplished that faith in you that he's looking for, it's going to cease. Now here's the good part. He says, next, he says, thou hast broken Rahab in pieces. Now, here's the wonderful, Rahab here is an epitaph for Egypt. But more than that, the Hebrew word that it's used here, listen closely, it means monster, wild beast, Leviathan, and the dragon. Well, who in the world is that? Who's the dragon? Who's the monster? Who's Leviathan in the scripture? The devil himself. Then what this is, it's, it also infers the monster problems, the monster lust, the monster sins. Now folks, what it, what actually being said here in Hebrew, Jehovah has smashed to pieces the power of the monster dragon and has fatally smitten every one of his enemies. Now folks, let me tell you something. For a number of weeks now, I've been preaching that you, there, there are besetting sins, there are bosom sins that are ingrained. It can be drug addiction, it can be alcoholism, it can be sexual sins and, uh, and gambling and all of these things. It can be covetousness. It can, uh, we talked even about you know, eating habits that uh, people just absolutely absorb by food, uh, or, or possessed by food. And we have been telling you that you cannot humanly, on your own power, through your own will, conquer those sins. Now, God doesn't bypass your will. No, we have a free will. God doesn't bypass your will. But our will, if we leave it to itself, without the infusion of the Holy Ghost and the empowerment of the Holy Ghost, the flesh will choose for it. The will will follow the flesh. It will choose what is comfortable, what it, it's attached to. That's why our sins are called members of the body. They become like members. And that's why he said, if, if your eye offend you, pluck it out. If your hand offend you, cut it off. Because our sins, our bosom sins, become like a member of our body. That's why he said we have to, to deal with these members of the body. But your will, you do not have the will. You do not have the strength in the human power. And I would go home sometimes. And I even ran this by Pastor Carter once. I said, am I a little too easy when I say, this has to be supernatural power that breaks down the dragon, breaks those monster sins. Lord, it, 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 am I taking away people's personal responsibility? Maybe people relax and say, well, I've got a problem, and if God has to do it, I'll just sit here and wait for him to do it. Now, I'm going to tell you now, God will not do it without you. He will do it, but he won't do it without you. He won't do it without the cooperation of your will. You have to want to be delivered. You have to hate your sin. You have to say, I don't want this in my life. I have, I, I want freedom in my life and I want to be pleasing unto the Lord. And my part is to hate my sin. And my part is to cry out to God. My part is to never make peace with my sin. If I make peace with it, it means I'm ready to live with it. I want this and I want Jesus too. Now, I'm not preaching it to you guys. I'm preaching to the whole congregation. Now, hear me, please. When I read this, it's incontrovertible. Here is the absolute proof that it has to be a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit working upon our human will. I will to be free. I want to be free. And I cry out to God, Oh, God, send the Holy Ghost. Send your power. God, your power has to break Rahab to pieces. Lord, you're the one who has to scatter all my enemies. Every demon power coming against me, I can't chase them. I'm no match for the devil. You chase all of these enemies out of my life. Chase them out. 
Lord, you smash that monster sin. You smash that dragon in my life. Hallelujah. Who, who broke Rahab to pieces? Rahab? Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. Oh, hallelujah. Remember what I tell you, don't be afraid of sin. Don't be afraid of it. Hate it, but don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid it's going to kill you or overwhelm you. No, God has a strong arm. You belong to him, and God's going to smash, going to bring his hammer down on that sin. Hallelujah. Now, two more minutes. I have to give you a warning before I close. Unbelief, when, when, when you're in a trial and things are hard, you begin to complain, you begin to murmur, you begin to doubt, there's unbelief. I want to tell you, that's not only painful to God, but it's deadly to you and me. It's the deadly thing to keep questioning God, to keep doubting, and, 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 and every time we get down and the testing gets a little stiff, we begin to, to question God in our mind, Lord, are you even hearing my prayer anymore? God, where are you? God, that's enough. We go on and on and on. We don't stop. Now, folks, the children of Israel did that. And God, in Psalms, look look at Psalm 78. You should go there before closing. Psalm 78. And take this warning from the Holy Spirit lovingly. A loving warning from the Holy Spirit. That we've got to stop our murmuring and our complaining before it becomes a deadly thing in our lives. It can destroy us. Psalm 78, beginning to read verse 54, 78, verse 54, beginning to read. He brought them to the border of his sanctuary, even to this mountain, which his right hand had purchased. He cast out the heathen also before them. By the way, who's doing this? God's doing it. They're not doing it. God's doing it. They are literally on the front lines, but God is empowering them to do it. He cast out the heathen also before them and divided them an inheritance by line, and made the tribes of Israel to dwell in their tents. Yet they tempted and provoked the Most High God. They kept not his testimonies, but they turned back. They dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. They provoked him to anger with their high places, and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. When God heard this, now see, then when he saw it, when he heard it, something they were saying, it's unbelief. It's talking fear and doubt and questioning God. When God heard this, he was wroth or angry and greatly abhorred Israel. It means he rejected Israel so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among men, delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hands. He gave his people over also to the sword and was wroth with his inheritance. Look at me, please. Folks, God has told me in no uncertain terms. He tells me lovingly, he's my father, and I'm his son, and he loves me. But God is saying, David, if you don't want to destroy your life, if you don't want to be turned over to the hands of the enemy, I'm asking you now to stop your complaining, stop your murmuring. If you're going to trust me, it's going to affect your language. You can't say, I trust the Lord, and talk unbelief. You're going to stand still now and see the salvation of the Lord. Don't anger your heavenly Father. Don't anger Him time and time again. Folks, I've been looking over some of the messages that I've preached in the last eight years in this church. This afternoon, I looked over some I've been preaching. I preached faith, faith. I've been preaching, don't doubt God, and yet I've not fully practiced what I preached. But God has put my back to the wall and said, David, you're going to trust me. I want you to be a testimony in these last days. I've got to have your testimony. It's not just in the pulpit. Your testimony is your walk of faith. Hallelujah. Will you stand, please? Will you stand? Do you understand, before we leave this service tonight, even before we give an invitation, that you've been called to what you're going through? How many will accept that and raise your hand? Say, I have been called to my suffering. I've been called to the furnace. I accept my calling. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to ask you for another show of how many in this church will say, God, by your grace, by your grace, stop my everlasting belly aching and complaining. 
and by murmuring. God, take it out right now. Lord, we come to you to be delivered from this. Deliver us, oh God. Deliver your people from murmuring and complaining and questioning you. Oh God. Hallelujah. Do you believe God's going to answer your prayer? Oh yes, he is. Hallelujah. You say, oh brother, I've been in so long, I want out. He knows when to bring you out. When you start shutting up and begin to talk faith, and I'm not talking about silly faith, I'm talking about, God, I know you have the power. I know you love me. You're not going to hurt me. You're going to see me through. Hallelujah. God, you're going to see me through. I trust you. Speak it. Let everybody see it around you. Let, let there be a joy of the Lord in your heart. They say, God, no matter what it is, you are going to see me through. Hadn't he brought you this far? Haven't you come this far by faith? Trusting in the Lord? You would be dead. You'd be on the streets. God brought you through. God brought you through. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, there are those hearing me now who have really been uh, overwhelmed and crushed and fear has laid hold of their heart. There's such a fear in them, oh God. I'm asking to deliver them from this fear. I'm asking, Lord, to stir up faith. God, let them turn to your word. Let them cry out to you, oh God, forgive my unbelief. Forgive my unbelief. Take it away. Hallelujah. Now there's some in the balcony here in the main floor that really need to walk down this aisle tonight because you've come to the place recently, you've been through so much, you've come to the place recently where you've, you've questioned whether God is even hearing you anymore. You've almost been convinced that God's not answering your prayer. Because it's been a long time. You haven't seen evidence of it yet. But it's, it's made you just a little angry at God, perhaps. Some of you, I think, may have a grudge against the Lord. Bring that grudge to this altar and leave it here. Leave it. Bring your unbelief and leave it here. Follow these that are coming now. From the balcony, just go to the stairs on either side and come down any aisle. That's it. The Lord's here tonight to set you free. And he wants to inflame your faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Whatever you're going through, you've got to learn this, please. God is at work in me. God's doing this. When you stop and say that, it changes everything. God's doing something in me. God's looking for something. He's taking me through something. Oh, God, don't let me fail. Strengthen my faith. Let me come through it trusting, speaking confidence in the Lord. Let me read to you just what the Lord gave me for you right now, you that came forward. In the day when I cried, thou answered me and strengthened me with strength in my soul. Though I walked in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You'll stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies and your right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Forsake not the work of thy hands, thine own hands. Let me read this to you. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not sleep. Behold, he that keepeth Israel will not slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade. The sun shall not smite thee by day, the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and coming in from this time forth, even forever. He said, I'm going to preserve your faith. Hallelujah. Didn't he tell Peter, the devil's trying to sift you, he's asked for you, but I prayed for you that your faith fail not. Jesus is praying for you right now. God, don't let my faith fail. Lift up your hands to the Lord right now. Pray that, Lord, don't let my faith fail. Forgive my unbelief. Ask God to forgive your unbelief right now. God, forgive my unbelief. Forgive my words of 
doubt and fear and murmuring and complaining. Forgive me, Lord. I've done this before your face. A faithful God, I have murmured, I've questioned, I've doubted. God, forgive me. Folks, ask God's forgiveness right now. We've got to be forgiven of this. Lord, produce faith in our hearts now. Hallelujah. Just tell him you believe in the Lord. You're faithful. You're going to see me through. God's going to see me through. God, see me through. Hallelujah. If there's sin in your heart, confess it right now. Lord, I confess my sins. If you're coming back to Jesus, just yield your spirit and heart to him right now by faith. He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. I want everybody in this house to raise your hands and thank God for his faithfulness. Even in our unbelief, he deals with us in love. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Deliver us, Lord. Deliver us from all unbelief. That we be a trusting people. A trusting people. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. You really do reap what you sow. Amen. Good and bad. You'd be surprised we're going to talk a lot about the good tonight as well as the bad. Why don't you go to Matthew, the 25th chapter, if you will, please. Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Let's begin reading at the 14th verse. Very familiar. Verse 14, very familiar. The kingdom of heaven is of a man traveling into a far country. He called his servants and delivered unto them his goods. To one he gave five talents, to another two, another one. To every man according to his several ability, straightway took his journey. When he received, he had received the five talents, went and traded the same, made them another five talents. Likewise also, he that received two, he gained another two. The one who received the one, of course, remember what he did, he digged into the earth. He had his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord, those servants come, cometh and reckoneth with them. He that received five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five. Behold, I have gained beside five more. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful of a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter in the joy of the Lord. He that received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered me two. I've gained two more. The Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He that received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee, thou art a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, together without straw. I was afraid, I hid it in the earth, there thou hast that is thine. The Lord said unto him, You wicked, slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I sow not, together where I have not straw. You should have therefore have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I would have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him, said ten. And of course, he was cast into outer darkness. Very familiar scripture. That has to do with reaping and sowing. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for Jesus. Holy Spirit, I need to be quickened. Holy Ghost, come and quicken my body. Let me speak as the oracle of God tonight. Lord, don't let anybody stay in this service tonight without being moved by the Holy Ghost, changed by the word of the Lord. Quicken us, Lord. Sanctify me. I take your authority, Jesus, over every demon power, every prince upon him, power of darkness, that nothing in this house can disturb or, or uh, hinder the word of the Lord from going forth, quickened by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this matter of sowing and reaping, you know, goes two ways. It's both good and bad. You know, all, all my life and all your life, you, Christian life, you've heard this. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, that has a bad connotation, but it also has a good connotation. In fact, probably most of my message tonight will deal with the good connotation. The Bible said, in due season, you shall reap if you faint not. Now, there is a sowing to the flesh. There's a sowing to the flesh that brings a terrible, awful harvest. How many people do you know that sowed to the flesh? And you know, you look at their life and they are reaping on all sides. Have you ever seen a day where there's been such awful reaping? Such terrible reaping for sins that have been sown? Uh, physical problems, mental problems, family problems on all sides? 
people who have been sowing to the flesh and sowing to the flesh, and now they are reaping what they have sown. It's an awful harvest. You can see the effects of the sowing to the flesh here in the United States. Let, let's talk about what America's reaping now. Let's talk about the nation first, not just individuals, but corporately as, as a nation. Look what we are sowing, for example, in our public schools. Do you know all through New York now, uh, the schools are in absolute chaos. We have teachers that are afraid to go into the classroom anymore. Let, let me remind you that in 1940, that's just one generation, in 1940, all classes opened with prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. They would pray first and then pledge allegiance to the American flag. But there was prayer every morning in school. That was one generation ago. God's blessing was asked upon the school. They prayed for the principal. They prayed for their teachers. And over the PA system, there was public prayer. School was open with public prayer. And they said, one nation under God. And folks, he honored that. He honored our classrooms. This nation was number one in education. I don't even know where it is now. Many nations have passed us. Many of our kids can't even read or write anymore. In 1940, just a generation ago, the top seven disciplinary problems in our schools were as follows. The number one problem in school in 1940s, right up to 1950, number one problem was talking in class. Number two was chewing gum. Number three was making noises. Number four, running in the halls. Number five, cutting in line. Number six, improper clothing. Number seven, not taking out the garbage. Not disposing of the garbage properly. Leaving apples on the desk, for example. Now, today, the most recent survey, let me give you the top seven disciplinary problems in our American schools today. Since we took God out, we took prayer out, we took the Bible out, we want nothing to do with God, we chased Him out, we want nothing that resembles God in our schools. Now, when I say we, we're talking about the liberal mind, we're talking about the godless people who have pushed this upon our society. The number one problem in our schools today, rape. Number two, and this, this is documented, <clears throat> robbery. Number three, assault. Number four, burglary. Number five, arson. Number six, bombing. Number seven, murder. That's one generation, folks. We are reaping. All of these are related to drug abuse. Every one of these problems have to do with young people that are on drugs. I don't know if you know that in Brook, up in the Bronx, in one of the schools just recently, a seven-year-old boy in first grade came and laid on his desk a whole bag of marijuana. And he was going to pass it out to his classmates. Seven years old in first grade with a bag of marijuana. I don't even know where he got it. I don't know the whole story. But it all has to do with drug-related problems. Well, we wanted God out. We let the devil in. It's payday. We are reaping in America in our schools what has been sowed to the flesh. They're calling now uh, for free condom uh, distribution in our schools, even to 7th and 8th graders. And now, you know what the latest, latest thing is now? Condom vending machines in all of our schools. Supposedly to protect our young people from AIDS. But you know what that's saying to our young people? We condone your sex. We know you're going to do it, so just protect yourself. What an awful, awful harvest that we are paying right now. One half of all the births in our city now are illegitimate. 50% of all the babies born to our young ladies now are illegitimate. One half of all the children born. The script, or according to the latest report, one-fourth of all pregnancies are now being aborted. Every one-fourth of all pregnancies are ending in abortion. And 22 million abortions already, and some believe it may be 25 million abortions, and many of them just girls going without their parents even knowing it. In just one generation, we've come from chewing gum to machine guns. Now, are you understanding how far we've gone and what kind of thing we have? In a Bronx school, a student brought an Uzi machine gun to class hidden under his jacket, loaded. There are reports of teachers now 
all over New York and in all of our schools, even in country schools now, have saying there's no uh, respect for authority. They curse the teachers. I don't know if you heard now that uh, uh, this past week, two days ago, I think it was, uh, the Pope was in, in uh, Germany, in East Berlin, and hundreds of young people were cursing, they stripping off their clothes, and they were throwing paint bombs at his Pope mobile. For first time, any kind of reception like that, young people, wild and absolutely, uh, and, and these were young people who were admirers of Hitler. Right out of school, out onto the streets, no respect for any authority. Then, of course, we they called uh, 20 years ago, well, almost 30 years ago, for a sex revolution in the United States. The liberal press and, and backslidden theologians called for a new day of sexual freedom. They said, we don't want any more of your Puritan moral standards. I said, anything goes between two mutually consenting adults. Anything goes if you're adult and you consent, anything goes. And so now we have homosexuals that have come out of the closet who were in the closet for many, many hundreds of years now, out of the closet, on the streets, parading, and now moving into the schools to teach their lifestyle, and then taking to the streets, and now it's become in-your-face perversion. In your face. Like it or not. They'll parade down the street with signs, we'll get your kids, like it or not. Some harvest we've paid. Some payday. Now it's payday with AIDS. Oh, God help us. The new disease is now 4 million cases of chlamydia. Chlamydia shuts the womb. And it looks to me like God's going to have to shut one womb for every abortion with chlamydia. There, there's, there's a new papillion now, a new cancer, uh, a sexual cancer that is horrible. There are things that we just can't even understand. So far beyond our comprehension. Payday. Syphilis is returning now. To the, to, to, to the uh, sexual generation. This uh, uh, revolution, sex revolution, has brought back syphilis. I have a Christian doctor who's on our board. He was here last Sunday sitting on the platform. And Dr. Rice said, Pastor Dave, he said, just 15 years ago, I had to give 600,000 units of penicillin 600,000 units for syphilis. He said, today, I have to give 4,800,000 units, and it still doesn't kill this virus. Think of it. 4,800,000 units, and it doesn't touch it because it's, it, it, it's uh, uh, becoming absolutely uh, immune to penicillin. And now with his uh, papilloma, it's called virus that's attacking many young women especially. And there's no end in sight. Almost every time you pick up the paper anymore, there's some new disease, sexually transmitted disease. Folks, it's payday. We are reaping what we have sown to the flesh in our society. Now, what does this word mean? You reap what you sow. <clears throat> Folks, the, the Lord means that. The Bible means that. Look what we are reaping with our children now when we allow child pornography. It is allowed. Child pornography is allowed. It's, it, it's, it's rife all over the United States now. And now, listen to me, folks. In the past 10 years, one of the number one problems in our society is incest. And primarily parents molesting their own children. Now, we don't like to hear these things, but folks, that is the, what has happened to our society. It's payday. You can't keep feeding this garbage into the minds of the American society without reaping in it what we, what we are reaping right now. We've become such a degenerate nation of, of some parents that are like wild animals and they're like beasts. Folks, I can't imagine a father or a mother raping their own child. It's a, that has to be a beast. Where has that come from? We are reaping what we have sown in what we call sexual freedom. And now, folks, we're about to reap another kind of harvest, and that's an economic crash because we have become a greedy nation. Wall Street right here is the, the, the bed 
the hotbed of all of this greed. Everybody trying to get their hands on one big glass killing. And what's happened, folks? L let me let me I quote you something I just read in a newspaper by uh, the Federal Reserve officer. He said, "Don't worry about multi-billion takeovers now with their ten-to-one debt load." He said, "There's too many other unknown forces out there." Now, folks, out there has become a term. Every politician understands it. Every economist understands out there is a whole unknown thing about society, about our economy. Nobody even knows where it's going. Nobody can explain what's happening. One day, and I've been warning about it for a long time now, one day, overnight, and I've told you the vision I've had repeated at least five times. I've seen, I don't know who the president is, I just see his chair, he's turned, his seat toward the window and he's got all of his cabinet and all of his counselors in the room and he turns and he says how did it happen and every man in the room has his head down and everybody's shaking his head nobody in the room can explain what happened and the president is saying what happened how did it happen folks is going to happen and nobody going to be able to explain it because it's payday we have been reaping greed uh, are sowing greed and we're going to reap a harvest. God, God has warned us and he's given us many, many opportunities to repent. But there's been no repenting. The Bible makes it very, very clear that we are going to suffer economically. <clears throat> there's a good side to this now. That's the bad side that I've just given to you. I hope you're ready for the good side. The Bible said, you reap what you sow. But he said, if you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap a wonderful harvest. Hallelujah. Uh, th th this whole story in, in uh, Matthew, the story that we just read to you, we went through it. <clears throat> I want to show you that the Lord is going to have a great host of willing sowers in the last days. How many believe that? God is going to have a whole host. He's going to have an army of people that are going to go out and sow the good seed. And before Jesus comes, there's going to be a great harvest. There's going to be a great harvest before Jesus comes. Now, this parable proves to me that God is going to have in the last day those who are bearing fruit. Now, often we focus on this one servant who goes out and he wraps his, his uh, talent in a napkin. He wraps it all up and buries it. And many people think the church is going to be like that, that the, there's going to be so much sin, there's going to be so much wickedness, and all these things we talked about, the church is going to be downcast, Christians are going to be defeated, and they're just going to take their talent and bury it out of fear. This man said he's afraid, and he, he buried his talent. And people have the concept that the church of Jesus Christ is going to be so inundated with all kinds of problems that the cities are going to become so wicked and so violent. That is true. But this parable, if you see it in the spirit, is saying, no, that, there, that the majority in God's house, in the remnant, the holy remnant, are going to be bearing great fruit. They're going to be coming with their arms full. They're going to be joyful. They're going to serve the Lord with gladness. The Bible said these men said, I have gained, I have gained. There's going to be gain. Hallelujah. The closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the more fruitful Times Square Church ought to be. And I believe will be as the days come. The, the, you know, the Lord is not affected. The kingdom of God is not affected by the economy. The kingdom of God is not affected by anything the devil does. The devil can do everything he wants to. He can do all the demons of hell out. He can come down with great wrath. But that does not hinder in one iota the plan of God. God's plan is not going to be affected by it. Hallelujah. I was looking at this this afternoon in preparing for the service tonight. Our, our Lord is the one who's, the Bible says, who's traveling to a far country. And after a long time, he's going to return. And the talent here represents the measure of grace and revelation of Jesus Christ. Some One man was given a great revelation of Jesus. He was given five talents. 
Another was given two talents, not, not as much revelation, but it was the true revelation of the grace of God. And the other was given a measure of the grace and revelation of Jesus. He buries his. But what happens? God says in the last days, he's trying to tell us that in the last days, he's going to have a people who trust him. He's going to have a people who are joyful in him. They know that he's not a hard taskmaster. If you think our God's a hard taskmaster, you're serving the wrong God. You have the wrong image. And that's why you bury your talent. That's why you have such a poor revelation of who Jesus is. Because you have a perverted view. You have never seen his grace and his mercy and his love for a lost humanity. Folks, I'm telling you, God is, God is absolutely, totally committed to saving a people. Do you understand he's committed to saving and keeping you from the power of the devil? He's committed to bringing you to his throne room. He's committed to presenting to you to the Father without blame, blameless before the Father. He's committed himself to that. He's committed himself that there is going to be a harvest in the last days. Hallelujah. So you can look at what the homosexual uh, uh, community is doing and, and, and say that doesn't concern the kingdom of God and his program. You can look at what is happening to our schools and you can grieve over it, you can pray about it, but that's not going to hinder the program of God. And, and I was, I've been very concerned about our young generation. We pray for our teenagers and that, but I'm going to show you in just a minute what God prophesied is going to happen. He, he, he's not going to let this generation be lost. There are going to be thousands and thousands of Christian young people in the last day coming to the Lord. Let me ask you, do you believe that the last day just before Jesus comes, there's going to be uh, a clearer and clearer vision of who Jesus is? Do you really believe what the scripture says that uh, though hell rages, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ? That's the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. The kingdom of God is not affected by demons or by the economy. By communism, by violence, or any world conditions. Hallelujah. This parable proves that God will have a last day army. Amen. I said a last day army prepared. I want to show you a prophecy. Now, before I turn there, remember, Jesus quoted this prophecy. Paul quoted it, and it's quoted seven times in the New Testament. So clearly, this is a last day prophecy of conditions in the church just before Jesus comes. Now, if this is good news. Go to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. I'm going to show you a prophecy about our young people. If you're a teenager tonight, oh, ask God to let this lay hold of you tonight. In fact, if you're under 25... I'd say that's young. At my age, anything is young. <laughs> Martin Luther said of this uh, chapter, a glorious prophecy concerning the kingdom of Christ. It ought to be one of the nearest, dearest scriptures to everyone in the church. One of the dearest, most precious chapters of prophecy in the Bible. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. What's God going to do with the enemies of Jesus? They're going to be under his feet. That's the prophecy. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Who is the rod of his strength? That's Jesus. Hallelujah. In the midst of thine enemies. To rule. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power in the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth now let me show you what this means follow me if you will please amen there's a day of his power look this way please the bible says there's going to be a day of his power now we know 
there's been a day of his power ever since Jesus arrived, ever since he was on this earth and ascended the Father. It's been the day of his power. He's shown his power for the last 2,000 years. But remember how God showed his power in, Israel, in Egypt? First of all, he, he, he shook the earth, and then he literally shook the heavens with thunder and with darkness, and he kept increasing the day of his power and increasing it. And what did he do? A final rage of death to the firstborn. There was a burst of power. And do you know what the Lord said he's going to do? He's been shaking everything. But he said there's going to be one last shaking. He said, I'm going to shake everything. There's going to be a day of his power. And we're living in that day of his power. And he said, and in the day of his power, when God comes down to start dealing with his enemies. And folks, he is dealing with his enemies now. Oh, yes. Even presidents in the United States, they can hide and hide. But if, 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 there, if God says it's time, he exposes it. That was Watergate, for example. And, and, and no matter who's in Washington, you can't hide from God. You can't hide. I don't care who it is, Republican, Democrat. You can't hide from God. God God's going to have his way. You're, you, some of you are too, too young to remember Khrushchev. He came to the United Nations here and, and sat there and took off his shoes and banged it and said, we're going to bury you. He's, he's, he's in a grave and he's dust now. All of these world leaders, these, these, these dictators, God just snaps his finger, blows on dust. He said that the nation of the world, a drop of dust in a bucket. He has all power and all authority. And folks, we're living the day of his power. When the Holy Ghost came, that was the day of his power. And he's increasing his power because he's about to come. And he said, in that time, my people are going to be willing. Hallelujah. He said, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised yet once more, I'll shake not on the earth, but the heaven. My people shall be willing. Hallelujah. Now, the scripture says, it's, this people, this prophecy says that they're going to see the beauty of holiness. Now, folks, you've got to stop here and listen to me, because God really spoke this to my heart. There, there are going to be people in the last time that don't feel that holiness is a burden. That, that you know, this reproof and all of this, oh, no, I can't live like that. God says there are going to be a people so willing... And have such a heart for him that holiness is going to become a beauty to them. It's going to be a joy, a wonderful experience. And, and they're going to thank God for reproof that provokes them to righteousness. Because they're going to say, uh, and, and really from their heart they see these are beautiful words because it produces a beautiful effect in my life. It's producing righteousness. My people, he said, I'm going to come in power and it's going to be my day of power and in my day of power... I'm going to have a people. God's not going to send angels down to do his work. He's got us to do it. And he said, I'm going to make you willing. Not only going to make you willing to go out and sow the revelation I gave you of my heart and of my son. You're going to, folks, we're going to have people going around who know Jesus in such an intimate, personal way that everywhere they go, that's the witness. They're going to say, I know you know Jesus. They can see it on your countenance. Everything about you is the revelation of Jesus. You're not going out with four little scriptures. You're not going out with some little thing that you have learned to quote. You're not just mouthing scriptures. You are a living testimony of who Jesus is. And the, the Bible says you're going to have such a beauty about you. It's going to be the beauty of holiness that you fully accept you know, we've got preachers in the pulpit screaming, we don't live by law anymore. The law is dead. It's gone. It's all grace. Yes, it is grace. But he said, I'll put the law in your hearts. You will love to serve me. You will love to fulfill my law because I'm going to give you the power to do it. Hallelujah. Folks, that, that, that's a wonderful church when people are serving the Lord just because they love him. Because there's a beauty in just walking with him. Hallelujah. That helps make you willing to obey him. Now, it says in verse 3, Thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now, folks, I'm not the only one that saw this. I was surprised that uh, Jonathan Edwards, Calvin, Rogers, and some of the great uh, 
prophets of God and writers from way back for the last 300 years. I, I, I thought I had some new revelation. You know, when you go out in the morning and you see the dew on the grass. Now, you'd have to go to Central Park in New York to see that. <laughs> Anybody been in Central Park when the dew comes? Folks, I was raised in the country. And when you go out in the early morning and you look at the dew, it's like millions and millions of diamonds, those little drops of dew. And he says, God says, I'm going to have the dew of youth. I'm going to have a whole sea of diamonds. I'm going to have the youth. And that's before he comes. It's going to be too late after he comes. This prophecy is being fulfilled in these are very days. They're going to be fulfilled. And I believe it with all my heart. God is going to have the dew of the youth. These are his diamonds. And that's exactly, exactly. It, it, and here's the meaning. These are young converts, servants of the Lord. They shall be like beads as numerous as drops of the morning dew. That's the meaning. As numerous as the drops of the morning dew. Folks, you don't go out in, in a morning in the field when the dew comes and just see a drop here and a drop there. The fields are covered with these diamonds. They sparkle in the sun. When the sun comes, they just sparkle. Has anybody seen that? Is, am I the only? Okay. All right. I thought I was the only one who saw that. Hallelujah. There is absolutely nothing in heaven or earth that's going to stop this last day harvest. Now, there's, there's something unique and special about these last day servants. This, this, these, these young people, especially, that God is calling and these willing people, they're not going to be afraid to plow in the cold. The scripture says the sluggard, that's the lazy Christian, he will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. You know who these people are? They're not going to have anything. It's harvest time. And the Bible says there going to be some. There are going to be churches just dead. There are going to be churches in this city while we are packed and our alders are filled and people getting saved. Your families and all over. The dew is falling everywhere and the diamonds are shining. And God's people are willing in the day of power. There are going to be people saying, oh, it's too cold out there. You know, the, the, the demon powers are out there, the, 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 the rapists and, and uh, uh, people don't want God. You know, when I came to New York City and talked to some pastors about my vision of coming here into Times Square Church, they said, they don't want God here. I've been here 15, 20 years, nothing happens. You can't have any church Sunday night. It's too cold, you know. People are not going to come out. People are not going. The, the, the subways are so dangerous. The city is getting so wild. They're not going to come to it. They might come Sunday morning, and that's it. Everywhere I got, you can't do it. Can't do it. It's too cold. Too cold. I don't mean you know the weather, but I'm, that that that's what it means. It, it, it's too hard. It's too difficult. It can't happen. I got so sick and tired of that. I got so sick and tired of that. Everywhere I went, if I listened to what I heard from my minister friends, God bless them. I'd have never come to New York. They about tried to scare me to death. One pastor I hadn't seen a soul saved in 10 years. At least that's the impression I got. Death everywhere. It's too cold to plow. God says, you go out in the cold and you plow. Doesn't matter what the weather is. Doesn't matter what people say. You go and plow and you sow your seed. I'm going to give you a harvest. Hallelujah. They said, oh, you, when I first came here, drug, drug addicts can't be chained. Nobody can. Drug addicts. When I first came to New York, there were, there were no ministries on drugs. In the United States, we were one of the first to, to prove to the world that Jesus could save a drug addict. It, up to that time, it was hopeless. Because at that time, in 1958, there was no heroin. Very little. Most of it was pot. Then in 19, after we were here about a year, all the, the drug addicts, all, all the gang leaders I was working with, I was preaching to gangs first because there, wasn't, there were no drug addicts on the street. Just musicians smoking pot and a few things. 1958, 1960, heroin hit. And all these... Gang members that I was working with 
were on the streets. Now, they weren't fighting. They were just trying to get money to support their habit. And I noticed kids out in, in the cold of night, uh, you know, it was zero out and they had no jackets on. They didn't feel the cold. And I was figuring out, man, these, these kids don't even feel the weather. I went up to one, so it's one. He said, I'm high, I'm high. He couldn't feel the weather. And, 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 and I began to suddenly see these kids vomiting and laying all over. And suddenly, I didn't know anything about drugs, but nobody, nobody believed that. Not even the church believed that a drug addict could be saved. Too cold to plow. God said, I'll save them. And folks, thousands and thousands have been saved now all over the world. Hallelujah. I'll tell you something else. These willing servants are not going to be afraid of the lion out there roaring. The scripture says the slothful or lazy Christian saith, there's a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. Proverbs 22, 13. Proverbs 26, 13. The slothful man says, there's a lion out there in the way. A lion is laying and waiting in the street. Devil's too powerful, they say. He's got the whole world in his hands. You know that song, he's got the whole world in his hands. They're talking about the devil. I don't believe, I believe God has the whole world in his hands. You know what the Lord said? Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city. Bring in hither the poor, the maim, and the halt, and the blind. Bring them in. He said, don't be afraid of the lion. Uh, some of you remember uh, about two years ago, there, there was so much talk about crime in the subways and everything. I got to thinking, boy, one of these days it might affect our uh, people won't come on Sunday nights and Tuesday nights. They only come Sunday morning because of the crime. And so <clears throat> on a Tuesday night or Friday night, I opened up the microphone and I, I said, if the Lord's delivered you, <clears throat> From a, you know, somebody tried to attack you and everything. Come up and tell us about it. And I'll tell you what. I, I heard one after another. We were here for about an hour, remember, hearing testimony after testimony of people who've been delivered. One lady, she said, I carry my, I don't know if she's here tonight or not. I carry my Bible in the subway. Anybody come around to hit me? She said, I'll use this in my club. This is my club. And I, I had, I had sisters all over the church said, Brother Dave, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I was the only one afraid. <laughs> Nobody else. How many are not afraid of the lion out in the street? Come on now. I'm not afraid of the lion out in the street. He said, go out into the streets and lanes of the city. He didn't say, go out in the lanes of the, except New York City in 1995. He said, go out quickly in the streets and bring in the hither, the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. But you know, there's a growing number of Christians, and I'm going to preach about five more minutes. There's a number of Christians now that are he heading for the hills. They're hiding. In fact, I get letters now from people on my mail list that, Brother Dave, and they say, I'm prophesying to you. I heard from the Lord. You have to get out of New York City quickly. You've got about six months left. It's going to be bombed. I've got others saying, Brother Wilkerson, God's telling everybody to flee to the hills, go to Montana, go to Wyoming, go somewhere and get a farm. There's a book just been written, and it's, it's by a Christian who's a member of the Coalition on Revival. And let me, let me read to you what he says Christians have to do now. They have to go out in the country and get at least five acres. You have to have $500 of silver U.S. dimes, a six-month supply of dehydrated food, a home water filter system, water storage facilities, chemical toilet, kerosene heater and lamps, survival stove, fire extinguisher, at least one forty-five Colt automatic pistol. This is, this is a, in fact, this man's a preacher who wrote the book. You've got to have a .30-06 rifle with a four-time scope, a 12-gauge shotgun with pump action. You, you must have ammunition a 500 rounds, 22 long-range ammunition, air rifle, reloading equipment, high-quality first aid kit, battery-operated shortwave radio, citizens' band radio, 50 pounds, one can pounds of coffee for exchange.
100 six ounce tins of cigarette tobacco so you can trade when the crash comes, 20 pounds of inexpensive pipe tobacco, one case of expensive whiskey, preferably Jack Daniels or wild turkey. That's what it says. Thirty Mexican gold coins, five U.S. twenty-dollar gold coins, and he says the booze and the tobacco is to bribe the law, the sheriff, in time of anarchy. You bribe people. Come on, this is a Christian. This is a, a preacher. He sent me the book, and I start reading through this. I said, I got to think. I can't find any of that in the Bible. I can't find any of that. My Bible says, go quickly out into the streets. Bring them in. Folks, you know where I want to be when the crash comes? Right here. With God's people. I'll tell you something. Let me tell you something. You're going to be safer here. Have you been reading the news about those people out in Montana? At a farm? With the FBI? They've got their guns, they've got their kerosene, they've got all that, they're in jail! <laughs> and we're here winning souls. <laughs> Let me close with this. The Bible said, he that seeks to save his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says they're going to cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them. While we are praising God, we're going to go out in a blaze of glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn around to at least three people and say, God has everything under control. God has everything under control. Everything. Stand, please. He said, Brother Dave, if you believe hard times are coming, why aren't you storing food? I've been storing food. Right here. <laughs> Beloved, our security is not in guns, not in a stash of food. Our security is in our Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Beloved, he's kept us to this time, hasn't he? No matter what happens, he's going to keep his people. He's going to keep you. He's going to keep me. Hallelujah. Folks, what I'm trying to say tonight, and the last thing we'll say to you, the Lord wants you to come to church with hope. He wants you to have hope about the salvation of your family. He wants you when you walk the streets to know that angels walk with you. He wants you to know that he wants you to be absolutely fearless. And he wants you to, to, to boldly tell everybody you can about Jesus and believe, believe that God's going to give you a harvest. That, that you know, many may reject it. But folks, you're going to find more and more people are open. People are hungry. They want to hear. And folks, you've got to believe what the Scripture says in, in Psalm 1. I believe that with all my heart. To me, that's not theology. To me, that's not just something I read and forget. I believe that with all my heart. And that gives me hope for the young people, and not only in this church, but in this city. No matter how they curse, no matter how they drink. It may be, look, I, I've thought for a whole while we've lost the whole generation. And then I go to the word that says, no, he says he's going to have the dew of the youth. He's going to bring diamonds out of these kids. He, they're going to be diamonds that shine. Look at, look at Timothy. That's all these guys in the front rows here. These, these were guys that society and everybody else gave up on and for... For Sarah House here. And folks, we've changed the name from Hannah to Sarah. We had to because there's a whole bunch of other Hannah houses all over the United States. And people are mailing us. We're confused by it. So it's called Hannah House. But these girls that are up here in the front, they are diamonds. But people would have thought nothing could have been done. I 
I'll, I'll tell you something else. Up there, down here, if God can save you, he can save anybody. If he saved you, he can save anybody. If he saved me, he can save anybody. Yes, hallelujah. God, give us hope. Give us faith. We are not a defeated people. We are a victorious people. God, God gave us uh, what I believe is the best theater in this city, right in the middle of Broadway. He's raised up a standard, and he is saving people left and right, people uh, from all walks of life, and he is moving by his spirit. God, help us to act and move, not in cowardice, not worried about a lion in the street or the coldness of conditions, but to trust him in all things. And, folks, we intend to keep plowing. God sent me here to sow. And you can't sow till you plow. We've been plowing and plowing, and now we're sowing, and we're going to reap. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We don't try to pack this altar or anything else. We're just here uh, to serve God's people and to reach those who are in need and the lost. But I feel that there's some balcony in the main floor. <clears throat> and here's what the Holy Spirit put in my heart just, just a moment ago. Some of you standing here have no joy. I don't know if you lost it or you just misplaced it. But the joy of the Lord is not there. You, you, you sat and you heard the message, but you sat with a burden hanging on you. Just hanging on you. Bring that burden to the Lord now, but please don't come unless you're going to believe with me that while I pray and we pray together, that's going to be lifted from you because the Bible said the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I don't want you to walk out of here weak. You that have come forward, if you can look this way for just a moment, please. I am so, uh, there, there's such a joy in my heart when I know how much he loves his children. The Lord loves his people. If you can only get this down, so you have to be totally convinced that God's not mad at you. If God were mad at you, he'd cut you off long ago. We'd all been cut off because we deserve it. But he's a God of love and mercy and compassion. Yes, he's a holy God. He's a just God. But that whole, that, that the wrath of God is against those who reject him. Those who reject his call, his plea. And his many, many mercies that he uh, extends to his people. But you're not that kind. You come here because you love him and you want him and you, you want your heart given to him. Isn't that why you came? You want to give your whole heart to him? How many could say amen to that? I want to give my whole heart to the Lord. I want to hold nothing back. Now, if you have a besetting sin, often sin uh, brings condemnation, guilt, and it cuts off the joy. It's hard to be in sin and have any joy. It's almost impossible. The only joy you can have if you're living in sin is a false peace and a false joy. So let the Holy Spirit bring that right out into the open and say, Lord, I know why I don't have joy, because I'm still living in sin. And you're going to pray with me that God break the power of that sin through the Holy Ghost. The Holy God will put the Holy Ghost in you with such power that, that you don't have to struggle. The Lord will just powerfully encourage you and strengthen you so that you're not fighting it in your own strength, but in His power, His strength. And listen, if, if, if you're listening to the lies of the devil, the devil will lie to you and say that you're not going to make it. Uh, he will bring depression on you. Sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's mental and, and, and spiritual. And many times then he will just come harass you with lies. But I'll tell you, wait, you know how to deal with the lies of the devil? Just remind him of the truth of God's word. <laughs> remind him of the truth of God's word. The devil has to flee at the truth. He can't handle the truth. Hallelujah. You just say, my Bible says, my Bible says if I confess my sins, he's faithful just to forgive me and to cleanse me, to make me clean. And when you're clean, the devil has no rights. Let me, I'm tell you, I want to tell you something. No matter how long you serve the Lord, no matter how strong you are in the Lord, He's always going to be an accuser of you. You're always going to have Him accusing you. 
So just don't put up with it anymore. Say, devil, I've had enough of that. I'm not going to listen to you anymore. I'm going to believe what God's word says. I'm going to stand on the word of God. That's when joy comes, when you take your stand on the word, not on your feelings. If I lived by feelings, I'd never, hardly ever be able to survive. You can't live by